Why bother with empty shelves at retail stores, waiting three days for a break to fill, or driving across town to find out your hobby shop closed at four when you always have a card show in your pocket? With Loop, you can instantly buy cards, packs, boxes, or into auctions with the click of a button and do it all while chatting with some of the best personalities and the best community in the hobby. Download the Loop app now on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket. Striped Live. We're coming to you yet with another series preview. My name is Azzy Gazoon, and I'm joined by a great panel of guests. As always, we have Kevin Baral, Eli Sussman, Alex Carver, and our great guest, Mike Anthony Valdez. Thank you guys all for joining us today. And before we dive into the Arizona Diamondbacks, as always, we'll begin by recapping the previous series. Uh, uh, San Diego uh. Cowboys, Miami was in San Diego. Lost the first two games after winning game number three on Saturday night, eight to nothing. Joe Dunan made his debut, hit a home run, hit a double. And just Sunday's game, I'm going to let you guys just sort of vent your opinions on what a heartbreaking game that was for fans, for executives, for players. They could have gone into Arizona at 500 after splitting the series in San Diego, but alas, they lose three out of four. Eli, Kevin, Mike, Alex, what are your thoughts on the – Devastating, devastating, devastating series that happened in Southern California. Can we just play the clip first? <laughs> just to sum up the whole the whole series? We've seen enough. I know, but for the ones who mm. may not have. You guys can see Salser. And there's a little bit of an edit here for you guys to just see exactly where that pitch was. Oh, man. Just put a picture of a meatball. That's more than enough, I think. And oh. I know Eli did that on Twitter. Oh, and then there was the picture with him and Cervelli, which was very sad. But... Very... Oh, there it is. Look at that. And there you <laughs> go. <laughs> you got the meatball, center cut, breaking ball, right down the middle of the plate to Jorge Alfaro. Padres win 3-2. to two. It really sort of, you know, you no one's going to remember the great play by Solster anymore. It was just a holy roller coaster of emotions. For Marlins and Padres fans, you know, Padres probably thought they were the last, you know, they were on their last out. They end up winning the ball game two to two. You guys want any thoughts on the series? I mean, in that last game, I think you said this, Isaac, in the spaces yesterday. The offense did what they had to do. They got two runs. They were in a good spot. Bullpen kept the game shut out. Trevor had a good start as well. And it just came down to that one pitch. One pitch could, could change the whole course of the game. And, that, and that, that's literally what happened last yesterday in the afternoon besides that pablo was good he was great actually he was phenomenal everything that means good any synonyms that's how you could describe pablo's start solar had a grand slam hopefully that was his first career grand slam i actually did not know that but hopefully he keeps it going and he keeps hitting avi garcia actually had a hit he hit, he made contact with the baseball um what else joe dunan good stuff from him and then the first two games i mean one run losses what can you do about it just unluckiness at this point. Offense tried to get it going towards the end. They couldn't. That's it. I mean, I don't, I don't know. Is it just unluckiness? Serious. I don't. I think it's a little more than unluckiness that there's some bad. When you lose five straight games, when you lose five straight games by one run, at, at that point, it's just they're doing either the same thing, game by game, or it's just unluckiness at that point. So that so no, that was what was was giving me a year, bit of a. I'm sorry, Alex. Oh, that was just making me bullish on the team a little bit because, like Eli mentioned, they were all one-run games, and you know there are the Diamondbacks. They're bad, but they're not you know that that bad. You know, they're not Pirates or Nationals s. So to be in all those games when your starters, you know, Sandy goes four and two thirds, to be in those ball games, it's at least a little bit encouraging. But you said it, man. The ninth inning has always been the problem, and it, it really glared at you in the face on Sunday. So I don't know if anyone else has any thoughts on San Diego. After last year with one one it run sucked games, was... they have to be on the winning side of those games. They, they, this year, they're when they want to win, they got to be on the winning side. And Kevin said it. I disagree with this, Kev. Sorry, and I said this to you, Isaac, last night that the offense did enough to win that yeah, game. I, I don't, I don't agree with that. They go one for six with runners in scoring position. You know, 
on the other on the defensive side of the ball, Wendell tried to lose them that game by making two pretty egregious throwing errors. So did the team really do enough? And obviously they didn't because they get walked off. Um, so I, I think they could have done a little bit more, especially with runners in scoring position, which has been a vice all year. Eli could probably tell us where they rank, but I'm pretty sure it's probably near the bottom. With runners in scoring position, they probably are very bad. So that's that's a problem as well, and that comes down to your we're supposed to be the heaviest hitters in the lineup not performing, and I won't go down that road again, but that's what it comes down to. Um, starters have been good. Bullpen has been mostly okay. Um, held them in that game, you know, for the bulk of it until the ninth inning when Solskjaer screws up. But Solskjaer himself has been, and everybody's going to look at that one pitch and say, yeah, the guy sucks. He made the great play, which Isaac mentioned. And before that, he was very good. Um, and he, he earned that, that opportunity to, to get out there in the ninth, and he threw a bad pitch. And Alfaro didn't miss. Um, that's baseball. Uh, you saw the catcher setting up on the outside. It goes back over the heart of the plate. And any, any major league baseball player, even Jorge Alfaro, is going to match that pitch. Even at yeah, no, what- So it sucks. It is what it is. But move on. Uh, right the ship, but they got to get it right in one run games for sure. And I want to go back quickly to that yeah. ninth inning, or better said, the Anthony Bass when he comes into the to that to that game. I think it was the seventh. I want to say, so he comes in, he gets the three outs, what nine pitches? He comes back in, gets the last two guys, and then Oker comes in, pitches five five pitches, throws five pitches. He could have came back for the ninth. They did it with Bass. Want to do it with Oker? The matchups look good enough to, to keep him out there. I understand. And I've wanted Solskjaer. I, you know, I've said this many times. I've wanted Solskjaer to be the closer. And it looked like they were going to do it in game three when they were up 3-0 before the Solaire Grand Slam. He was warming up in the bullpen ready to go. But in that case, use the guy that's already in who's pitched, who's thrown five pitches. I mean, that's what they should have done. Uh, Donnie would never do that. <laughs> but Don, I, mean, I don't know. He did it with Bass. So you could have done it with Ogre. Gil, he my, always has. A, I had to put my club in the game. I got to put my guy in the game or someone in the game, no matter what the matchup. Just like, got to be a robot, put someone in that situation, not matchup dependent, and then bit us in the butt. But I mean, we the last two games we had um, they didn't score for 17 straight innings, which is crazy. And then we're just cursing the ninth inning. What's funny was game three of the series, you hear speaking about like. When, uh, that top of the ninth that we need the insur- insurance run. So I kind of agree with Alex. Like, we need those ins- insurance runs, and we didn't get them. And, you know, you kept San Diego in the game, and they, they finally got a one big hit. And now we're very sad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I see both arguments, but, like, um, I think it was Alex Krutchik who said it. Your offense isn't going to score – eight runs every single time. Your offense won't be able to give you those insurance runs, especially against good teams with good bullpens, like the Mets, for example. You're going to have a tough time getting those insurance runs across. So when you do happen to have a two-run lead in the ninth, you have to be able to completely, you know, dominate the ninth inning and make sure that Jorge Alfaro, who could probably be the worst hitter in Major League Baseball, doesn't beat you. So, you know, that just brings up the next topic, the bullpen as a whole. Today, pregame, a move was made to help solidify the bullpen a little bit more. Old friend Dylan Floro, reinstated from the injured list. Uh, Joe Dunand, unfortunately, I guess going two for four with two extra base hits is not keeping the big leagues. He was sent down back to AAA Jacksonville, more of a roster thing more than anything else. I'm sure we'll see him again at some point over the next year or two. But the bullpen should be in a bit, a little bit of a better shape now. Eli, Kevin, anyone else with their thoughts on Floro coming back? Yeah, um, Floro, if we were assuming he was 100% coming into this year, like it wasn't an exaggeration to say he was the best pitcher in this bullpen heading into the year, given the way that Bender ended last year. Um, some question marks about Solcer, given that his track record wasn't as long as Floro. Like This is a big deal on paper if we're getting 100% of Floro Something I've been documenting throughout his rehab assignment is that Floro doesn't look right. He's just throwing two and a half, three miles per hour slower than usual. And that is not normal, even for a rehab assignment. I So I would temper expectations for the immediate term just because of how long this rehab assignment took. It took longer than expected. Something is just not quite normal with him at the moment. Maybe he could work his way into it. So I think... In the if, if we assume that relatively soon he's going to get back to his normal self, this is a very big addition. Uh, the timing of it, unfortunate for Joe, but keep in mind, Richard Blyer just went out for on the 
COVID IL, even though they won't say it. So they were a man down in the bullpen as well. Um, that's just, I think that was the big motivation here is they need to make tricky choices. And I guess the choice you could like argue against is Joe or Eric Gonzalez, who right. they just brought up the day before. And so I, from that standpoint, I guess you, given the, you could go both ways on that. At least Gonzalez gives him a little bit more defensive versatility because he plays shortstop. He also plays yeah. in the outfield, which Joe Dunan doesn't do. He hasn't done it a lot, but he can fake it, and he can, he can you can put him there if you have to. So, yeah, there's more positional flexibility with Gonzalez. And like I told you guys, he's played a lot more games in minor league baseball this year than Joe Dunan. I think Joe Dunan, I mean, it's great what he did. It was awesome to see him get called up after he grinded it out. As I've told you guys, since 2017, he's been with the Marlins and gets his chance and showed really well. That's great. But the guy's only played 15 games this year. Um, you know, So I, I really think it was just a case that he happened to be on the flight, he happened to be on the taxi, and they needed a guy and they had to go to somebody. Whereas Eric, that may be a guy that they wanted to go to first, but Joe just happened to be there at the time. So I think that's that's your situation there. But, yeah, I think, Eli, you're right, that there's more positional flexibility with um, with Gonzalez, and he's played a lot more in AAA. So. That's, you, that's probably what came down to the decision for him. And you think they want Eric Gonzalez since he could also play the outfield over Charles LeBlanc, yeah. who who should be up here as well at this point with all these injuries. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm. We've mentioned him. But, yeah, I mean, uh, Eric Gonzalez is 30 years old. He's been in the major leagues before. Um, so, you know, um, it, it, LeBlanc deserves the shot, yes. But Gonzalez is a good choice. Uh, uh, LeBlanc also doesn't play the outfield. So, like I said, um, this guy – is basically like birdie. He can play pretty much everywhere. So that's exactly who he replaced. Yeah, and quickly with um with Floro, Eli mentioned that his velo was down. I think what what you say, Eli is three miles less. I think is what you were saying. It was like from ninety five to ninety two. I mean, look at this. This is ninety six right here. Ninety six. There it is. Yeah. And he, so his velo went three down. Three I think he's maxed days. out perhaps at ninety. Three, maybe one pitch at 93 on this entire rehab assignment, but mostly sitting right around 90, 91. And that is a very significant difference in the big leagues if you're pitching the exact same way. So maybe he's doing something different that he feels either with his delivery or with his pitch mix or with his location that could offset that a little bit. But I think our assumption has to be that he's simply not going to be as good as he was last year, at least for the time being. And for the ones who may think he's just going to step in right at the closers rule, I think they'll work him up little by little unless they're that desperate and they'll just throw him right in right. there. Right. So, Kevin, the problem is who, who closes in the meantime? Everybody they try in there doesn't <laughs> get it done. I would I try they, Oker. At this point, try Oker. I mean, they I don't mean, want to rush him back there, but they also don't want to keep losing one-run games. And they yeah. well, lost well, look, a the lot of their one-run games. The problem with Okert is look what they look what they did in the last game, Kev. They basically looted him. They put him in to face Eric Cosman, yeah. who's a lefty, and then took him out after five pitches. So yeah. I don't think they see Okert as a closure. But yeah, I mean, I think I think it's fair. Um, is it is it Floro right away? I don't I don't know. I mean, I think it probably will be because, like Eli said, they don't really have anybody else who's been good in that in that position. But you you put Floro in, and he's throwing 92-93, and he's. I don't like the sound of that for a closer, for sure. But we'll see. I want to preach yeah, this not, comment not. that Andre put in here about him starting slow from a velo. I'll get back to you on this because I don't know if that's true. That'd be an interesting thing if it's true about his velo creeping up during and, the year. And one thing I wanted to ask is after Solster coming out yesterday, you know, making that outing, would you guys give him another chance? I would like to see him maybe go one more because that was just a meatball you gave up to Alfaro, to be honest with you. It was it was a bad pitch selection at that moment. And the one pitch you couldn't give Alfaro, he gave it to him, and he saw what he did. I, I would like to see Solskjaer at least one more time because they let they let I think uh, so. Tanner Scott go out there a couple times. And some of the and Bender, they, they let him blow two saves. So, you know, I, I, I would like to see Solskjaer, who's probably the most experienced closer out of the bunch without, you know, excluding the, Dylan Floro. But I wouldn't mind seeing Solskjaer go out there one more time since he, he was able to do it last year. In what at the time was hitter friendly in Camden Yards. Mike, you agree or disagree with Mr. Kevin Burrell? Oh, uh, 100%. I think it was two outs. You know, it was a cookie, but I think in another situation, maybe that ball's, you know, two more inches down in the dirt and he swinging a miss. You know, I think one more chance we can give him. You know, I think we've given Bender a lot of chances and he's blown them. We've given Scott two chances. He blew one. Uh, I don't think Head has that stuff to put him there. I don't think 
anyone else has that stuff right now, and I don't think we should rush Flora. So I think absolutely if today against Dimax, we're three two in the ninth. I think we should throw Solcer one more time. Yeah, I mean, though I agree. I guess what you really have no one else to try. But the thing with Solcer, the stuff, you know, it's not much better than Lewis Heads. He's just been a better reliever. And he did give up a couple of, you know, that Trent Grisham swing in the ninth yesterday. That's easily taken it for right field. You just have a phenomenal play by Joey Wendell robbing that. Jerson Profar smoked one up the middle. C.J. Abrams got a base hit. He was very lucky that he got to the point of getting Alfaro with, you know, no runs allowed because he really didn't wasn't fooling many guys. He got Austin Nolan uh, some pretty questionable calls, but that was about it. So it was a bit of a sketchy performance all around, but he has proven to be the better. The Elms were that good either on both sides. Noah, the were that we're, good. we're joined by Noah Berger, who is taking time out of his busy schedule to watch a, to sit with us for a little bit. Your thoughts, your brief thoughts. On My heart still show. hasn't slowed down from the second period. Um, Padres. I, I, Padres, right. We played them. Um, I, I, I really liked what I saw from the front end in the middle part of the bullpen. The back end scares me. Um, Solcer giving up that meatball to to Alfaro. The second we saw, the second you saw Alfaro coming up, grabbing a bat, you knew what was going to happen. We all knew what was going to happen. There was no stopping that. He shouldn't have thrown a meatball to him, but we all knew what was going to happen in that situation. Um. Anthony Bassett looked really good. Steven Okerts looked really good. Um, Anthony Bender not in the ninth. He's he's now he's the bass of last year. Um, I don't no, go to that extent, but yeah, it's starting to look like it. Um, it is. <laughs> and I'll, th- I'll throw this out there. I might get yelled at, and I'm yelling at myself even now. Thinking about it, why not give Bass another chance at the closer role? Yeah, so about... Can't be Bass. much worse than a meatball to Alfaro. Yeah, so about Bass being in the closer role, really. I, I think, I honestly think they're one blown save away from that being, you know, what happens. Alex has been preaching that for a couple couple days now. And yeah, he has been your most effective reliever by far, by a wide margin. Anthony Bass has been. The velocity has been there. The stuff has been there. He's incorporating the splitter once again, using the slider to get, you know, backdoor sliders against lefties. He's pitched really well. And the problem was it wasn't just the ninth inning as Eli mentioned it was getting left-handed batters out so I think you know if it's gonna be a first time closing again for Anthony Bass in a Marlins uniform I would try and navigate it towards a righty heavy part of the lineup if you can and that that'd be a favorable position to put Anthony Bass back in the closers role I don't know if you guys concur well tiny sample says this year he's been better against lefties than yeah. last year all of a sudden those platoon splits are almost closed this year he, he he's been very particular about when to use that splitter against lefties um and pretty much been avoiding the slider against lefties he's pretty much just been going pretty much all sinkers and sometimes a splitter and a, or a four seam fastball against a against left-handed batters because they, they Cowan about Bender. I want to I want to give Andre some credit. Funny, I, did, by the way. I did look it up about Floro, and he were he was exaggerating a little bit, but he was on the right track. That Floro's velo coming out of the year last year was his lowest in April. It was like right around ninety three average, and then through the year it crept up towards over ninety four. It was pretty steadily climbing from the start of the year towards the end of the year. So that a little sign of optimism that he is. Perhaps actually healthy, but still just a slow starter physically. That we could expect him to be close to normal as the season goes on. So fingers crossed with that. Yeah, let, let's hope so because you know it's not really encouraging when you know your prob- your most reliable bullpen arm is throwing in Triple A Jacksonville 92, 91, a lot of ninety mile an hour. And the guy who got called up, or I'm sorry, the guy who is still up and not Joe Dunand is Eric Gonzalez and Alex. I was talking to you about this. Yeah, he has all the defensive versatility in the world, but he also is probably one of the best hitters in AAA. And I'm looking at his numbers, hitting 392, 417, 526, 943 OPS. It, how good of a hitter can he actually? I know he was with Pittsburgh for a little bit, if I'm not mistaken. How good of a ball player can he be? Will he get a start maybe against Bumgarner tomorrow? Yeah, it's 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 an experienced guy. Like I told you, he's 30. He's, I think, 30. Um, he's played in Major League Baseball before. He's a super utility guy. He knows his role. He knows what he is. And that's exactly what he's serving in now. Like I said, he's basically John Birdie um, with John Birdie on the um, undisclosed reasons uh, injured list um, that we all 
know what it is. But yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's a decent replacement for him. Um, it was a, a guy that stuck around in camp as a as a, um, a minor league signing with an invite to spring training. He stuck around in camp basically all spring, I believe. If you guys saw it, right? I'm pretty sure he was there as a replacement yeah. in most games, if not starting some games as well. He played. And he, yeah, he's a decent right-handed hitter. Um, I, I think you're right. I think you could start see him start. You know, you know Donnie likes to sit the lefties. Um, you can see him start for maybe Wendell tomorrow. You can slot him in in the outfield. You can put him at shortstop. You can put him at second base. He plays basically everywhere. So yeah, it's it's a good it's a good selection to come up. I would like to see LeBlanc, but like I said to Kevin, um, you have a little bit more versatility out of the outfield. And for a little while, at the start of the year, like midway through the month, I think he was actually leading the Marlins organization uh, in minors, I should say, Jeez. in WRC plus. So he's hit in AAA, and he's he's earned it. He really, really has. Um, I think he's still like sixth or something uh, in WRC plus, or at least he was when he got called up. So, yeah, he earned it. Um, like I said, uh, knows who he is, done developing, little left to prove in the minors. Give him a shot. See what happens. Um, oh, I'm not against him at all. I hope he gets a chance, for sure. <laughs> not yeah. not the best number choice, but I'll respect No, I, pu- I put that up for a reason because I know Alex mentioned oh, John Birdie in the say. same sentence. I, yeah, I'm not quite as optimistic. I think this is a rich man's Devin Marrero. Yeah. A little bit better hitter than Marrero and – a little extra i think he's a better defender overall and a more versatile defender a rich man's version of him but i'd be shocked if he hits anywhere in the vicinity of league average and i have a hard time seeing him lasting until after all the covid has subsided fingers crossed in the near future with this team i don't think he's going to stick around on the active roster yeah. it's amazing what he's doing in, in AAA. you got to give him credit he is scorching the ball as well as anybody on a team where everybody seems to be hitting pretty well he is been especially productive so this is a fair reward for him for sure to see if it translates and maybe he does surprise us maybe whatever he's been doing with jacksonville does translate i'm just skeptical as a guy that has played what like five different seasons in triple a like there's diminishing returns to these results once you get a certain number of reps at that level but just, i'm just I'm happy clear. Just to be clear, yeah, for sure. Just to be clear, um, I don't think he's as good as John Birdie. Um, John Birdie's definitely, I think, a better baseball player. I agree with you, Eli. I'm saying that that's who he's replacing, clearly. Um, otherwise, he would have gone to a pure infielder like Blanc or somebody else. Dunan could keep him up, right? Um, but, yeah, that's that's who he's replacing. Are you going to get the same production? Probably not. But I hope he gets a shot. I mean, he definitely has earned it, as Eli said. So it's good to see them reward good work um, because that guy's been really doing well in AAA. Speaking of rewarding good work, Alex, the sixth hole, the sixth hole hitter in the lineup. Why is he still there? You mean Avi? Why is he yeah, in the lineup him. at all? Why well, is he still there? Let's try and stay. You know, other side of the break, we'll get into that. Yeah. Once we get there. Um, Mike, Anything yeah. else from you, Mike? Well, yeah. While we're on this, no. I was going to ask Alex. Speaking of LeBlanc, what what would it take, or like what situation could we see him actually come up? Because the guy for for me should be in the big hurt, league no? somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, no, um, it's it's a similar situation as to what you're seeing now. As I said, Mike, I don't, you probably heard me. Um, I think he was the guy that they probably would have called up instead of Joe Dunand if they were at home. Um, if they were at home uh, and they needed a guy right away, he it probably would have been him. But Dunand was on the flight. They're out west. They needed somebody right away. It's Joe Dunand. If they're at home, that's Charles LeBlanc. That's your answer. Um, mm-hmm. If somebody goes down in the infield with an injury, he's he's probably right now one of your first guys up. And I hope that answers the question. Yeah. Yeah, I'm someone like if next time I do, you know, do we do having game coverage when they're back in Miami, that is something I, I'll be sure to ask Kim in because no one has asked her about Charles LeBlanc. That's been a name that has just not been mentioned once by any reporter. So that's something I'm eager to ask about. And, to sort of segue like, to the Diamondbacks, second time the Marlins see them in, you know, very short period of time. Eliezer Hernandez will be pitching the opening game of this series. A lot of speculation regarding that name. He is considered the weak link of the rotation, et cetera, et cetera. There is a guy in AAA who is seems to oh, be. Look, his look at that. Where did that graphic come yeah. from? Oh, wow. Keepers. How how'd you know where I was going with that, Eli? Anyway, yes, the guy on the right does seem to be major league ready. He does seem to be uh, one of the top five pitch starting pitchers that the Miami has in the organization, yet he's not in the starting five rotation. Is this the last time we see Elias or make a start for the Miami Marlins? I'll leave it to you guys. It I would lean towards, does, yeah, I would lean towards not the last time right. um, ever, and probably not the last time this season. 
but it could very possibly be the last time for a while at this point. The majority of his outings this year have been bad. There was one in the middle against the Phillies that in hindsight doesn't look so impressive because that Phillies team has been really up and down. And we, we know what his limitations are. When you look down to AAA at Meyer and not far behind him, Edward Cabrera, you look at them and the upside is pretty obvious. And for a team that has coughed away some of these one run games, even if we feel the true talent on the team is better than the record, oh. uh, this is a bit of a hole that they've dug themselves into and they have less margin for error moving forward if they want to make the playoffs. So to raise their ceiling, um, it seems like the pretty obvious decision, um, but it's going to seem to depend on the results and they want to let it play out a little bit longer. So I, I really don't know exactly what happens as a result of this outing. I don't know how much they're going to overreact to a single outing, but my stance on this is pretty clear that this is already overdue to make a change. And Eliezer, there's a whole lot of pressure for him if he has any hope of actually holding on to that spot. Yeah. yeah, overdue is probably the best word you could use at the moment because I'm just looking at the stats right now, comparing them. Max Meyer dominates Eliezer Hernandez in every single stat category era i mean max meyer has a 1.72 era and i'm frozen on my camera <laughs> i'll turn that off but show must go on me. yeah the show must go on but and eliezer has a 6.66 era so that's just one that you could look at max meyer has a 0.86 whip eliezer has a 1.44 whip i'm not going to go too much more into that but max meyer is the better pitcher overall he needs to be up yesterday in the major league um, maybe we'll see him in the Milwaukee series. Hopefully we do, but this start, and I know Eli said, I don't know how much of an overreaction or underreaction it's going to be, but this is going to be a, this is probably one of the biggest starts because something I've noticed this season is that this front office now with Kemen or led by Kemen has a shorter leash for players. You know, that's something I've noticed at least from my end that this, they're, they're, they're willing to get rid of guys quicker if they're not performing to what they should. Alex Jackson, they traded for him. They got rid of him very quickly. Just That's just one name. There are many others, but well, that's the main one that comes up to mind. And counterpoint. Someone... Counterpoint well, of Iseo Garcia. Ahead. I need but, to fix my... Oh my God. The counterpoint to that is of Iseo Garcia is still there. and But that's beside the point. Um, yeah, but that's different. I He's think on a four I do think 100% um, Max Meyer should be up at the major leagues. Um, I, I would not be shocked if they move to a six-man rotation when Edwards ready to. Um, Eliezer is on a very short leash, I th- I, I, I would suspect. Um, well, a shorter leash than he's been on before. Um, I, I still don't understand why they even leave him out for the third time <laughs> through the order. There's just no point. It's It, it, it literally is the reason he's terrible is the third time through the order. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see. I hope Max Meyer makes his way up very soon. You never know. So, so speaking of, speaking of, of uh, six man rotations, um, I know we have a series to get to, which that's what we're talking about. Right. But there's something to watch for on the 12th, uh, excuse me. Yes. On the 12th uh, Thursday, that is a Marlins off day. There's something to watch for that day. That is Max Meyer's scheduled throw day for the Jacksonville Jumbo Shrimp at home against the Nashville Sounds. If Max Meyer does not make that start, you know. So watch for that on the 12th. And you, you could know, even you could even go as early as the 11th if they scratch him a couple of days before that start, or maybe 24 hours. They're before not the flying start. him out west. That's not happening. No, 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 no. I'm saying that they'll if they're scratching him, they announce they'll, it. They'll, yeah, they announce it just the next day, but you'll you'll know. That's what I'm saying. It's They're not going to fly them out west. And to, yeah, just really quick, just to really show I, how overdue, like Eli mentioned, how overdue this you know could seem. Max Meyer, he was drafted in 2020. They they had him around just in case they wanted to use him in the postseason. Like they felt he was that ready to be used then. Oh, he was. 2021, he was utterly dominant. Ever since he put on a professional uniform, he has been as dominant as they can, as can be. 100 innings last season, 113 strikeouts, an ERA of 2.41. And this year, more of the same. He has not struggled at any point in his professional career or in his college career. He's been ready, and I really think that unless Eliezer throws a nine-hit, nine-inning no-hitter, we will not – Max Meyer will not be making that start, as Alex mentioned, on Thursday. 
he's ready and he will make this team a lot better. But yes, he has been, you know, he was a college guy. Remember that he has been ready to, you know, be in the major leagues probably for a, a little while now. So I, I'd be really surprised if he's not in the major leagues at least and, by the end of May. And if Meyer does I, make his major league debut, I think it'll be on the 14th, which is when Eliezer is scheduled to pitch next. So we'll be seeing him Saturday. I think it's against Corbin Burns. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, That's but I think it's against Burns. Burns. So Mike, that'll yeah, be a nice matchup. How eager are you to see the top pitching prospect as of right now? Maybe behind Yuri. Wow, what three right-handed, right-handed monsters they have in Yuri, Edward, and Max? All, well, two of them are close. One of them is right behind them. How excited are you for Max Meyer? I've been, I've been ready since April to see him pitch already. He's been due. What's funny about it, watching Valley Sports, is that they've been teasing him since. Eliezer's like every single Eliezer start, they talk about Max Meyer. They go to Kelly Sacco. She talks about say Max Meyer did this, and then Max Meyer did this. Uh, Edward Cabrera did this. They talk about other pitchers every single time Eliezer starts, and it's hilarious because they know that he's he's the guy who's gonna get taken out. Yeah. And it's like, when are you gonna do it? You tease it every week, every time he comes on. Tommy Hudden talks about how he's not gonna get past the fourth inning. Just pull the trigger. What are you waiting for? It's time. It's time. And I hope today we win 10 to 9 and a laser gives up 9. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a good before, way of putting it. Before we go on to a, a loop break. But yeah, I, I wouldn't expect Mike Smart when he is up here to be going eight, nine innings, you know. So, they, but it will help the bullpen because, like we mentioned, Eliezer has a very tough time pitching well past the fourth. Max Meyer should not only just help, you know, innings one through four, one through five, it should help the bullpen long term as well. But with that said, we'll go into a quick intermission. Yeah, stick with us. 30 seconds. Why bother with empty shelves at retail stores? Waiting three days for a break to fill or driving across town to find out your hobby shop closed at four when you always have a card show in your pocket. With Loop, you can instantly buy cards, packs, boxes, or into auctions with the click of a button and do it all while chatting with some of the best personalities and the best community in the hobby. Download the Loop app now on iOS or Android. Loop. A card show in your pocket. Hey guys, hope you didn't miss us too much. As much fun as it is to, you know, talk about Max Meyer and just sort of see when that's going to happen. We do have a series to preview. The Arizona Diamondbacks, Miami just got their ass handed to them in Miami, no less, in three games. Some heartbreaking ones. They had a game one, but ninth inning, like we mentioned previously, struggled and cost, us, cost Miami that game. Lineups are out. All the regulars in for Miami, except for Brian Anderson, which we know why, obviously. Normal lineup for Arizona. No strange ones there. We are facing Humberto Castellanos, who did really dominate Miami for some reason. Down south, does Miami adjust and hit better against this right-handed pitcher? So you mentioned that Arizona has the same lineup as usual. We're actually going to see one of their top guys, Alec Thomas, right, for the first time. And we'll see Dalton Varsho at, at catcher. So – only difference, but Umberto Mejia did hand uh, did dominate us. That, yeah, we should talk about else. we should but, talk about Alec Thomas a little yeah. bit. He is a prospect that's held in just as high regard as someone like Max Meyer. He was a consensus top one hundred guy. Many people's opinions, the number one prospect in the whole D backs organization. He just made his debut yesterday. This is so. Yep. This is his second game. I think it's interesting that he in particular got called up because the D backs have had this carousel in center field ever since they traded this guy named Starling Marte to the Marlins. They they put Varsho out there, who's really more of a catcher. They've had a cycle of utility guys that don't really belong out there. Thomas is the one that's supposed to be the true everyday option, finally, for them, so, and somebody that has the, those kind of tools that Marte does. He is supposed to be an above-average, everyday center fielder for the foreseeable future. And on paper, this is a, a better d backs team than it was last week. Remember last week, uh, they did not look good. We all thought they were going to lose the series to the Marlins. A lot of us thought the Marlins were going to sweep that series. Don't and, get the broom, uh, Yeah, and so we were wrong about that. And now um, they seem poised to be even more competitive than they were back then. They enter the series with a better record than the Marlins do. Go figure. That's a prospect well, I really like, Eli. Um, and I know, as you mentioned, evaluators like this guy as well. I love, and I always mention this to you guys, and I write about it too, when a player has a, a pedigree of coming from a – baseball background and this guy's dad was a major league baseball player i think alan thomas major league baseball player not the biggest dude in the world he's like 5'10 right but the hit tool is so good and the bat speed is ridiculous gives him like 50 grade power and it plays 
and he's fast as hell in the outfield. So this guy's a five tool player for sure. and definitely can be. Um, Diamondbacks are excited about him. They should be. Flew through the minors and he was drafted in 2018, and he's here he is right now at age 22. So definitely the real deal. Um, that's definitely a guy to watch when it comes to the Diamondbacks and probably their top prospect, as you said. So definitely a guy to look for. Yeah, listed at 5'11", 175 pounds. He's been a consensus top 100 prospect for the last couple of years now, according to Baseball America, you know, MLB Pipeline. No, he was actually rated as high as number 32 overall prospect in all of Major League Baseball in twenty before the 2022 season. Definitely will be exciting to see him. Eliezer is really going to have his work cut out for him with the amount of lefties. There is only one right-handed batter in the Arizona lineup today. Only one, and that's uh, Christian Walker. Christian so. Walker. I, I would not be surprised if you know it's going to be seven seven. It's a high. It's going to be a high scoring game, in my opinion. Whoever does their betting, I would pick the over for sure. Game two, it'll be Madison Bumgarner, as you know, Fish Stripes cleverly said he should be well rested. He was ejected after the first inning down in Lone Depot Park. Is this a, is this a situation where maybe he struggles, or is is he going to have you know? A little chip on his shoulder. So I have something I want to put out there about this DVX rotation. Statistically, right now, they are right near the top of the heap. They are at the second to lowest rotation ERA in baseball, only behind the Dodgers. It's 2.2 something in the low twos, their entire rotation. That is not sustainable, as you would guess. But you actually dig into the numbers, and it's even flukier than you would think. As as That's probably Danny Alvarez checking in. Good to Definitely. see you, Danny. With this D backs rotation, they have the lowest batting average on balls in play, and they have the lowest percentage of fly balls that turn into home runs. So those are two things that you really cannot control very much as a pitcher. Two things that are going to like regress big time. It's just a question of when. Um, and it's a question of which particular pitchers in this rotation it happens to. So uh, that's it that makes me a little bit more optimistic that the Marlins are not going to be swept again just because. The talent in this rotation is good, but it's not nearly to the level of their results so far. Yeah, and in Arizona, the offense tends to. Like, really, really top-end guys is Merrill Kelly and Gallon, And the other guys, like, maybe Bumgarner can have a good season, but I think the rest of the rotation can get knocked in one day. But Merrill Kelly has really good stuff, and Zach Gallon has been really good after last year's injury. Yeah, and then um, Bumgarner's actually sneakily had a really good season as well. He's sporting an ERA of 1.5, so that's you know surprising for this for this Arizona Diamondbacks team. Obviously, Humberto Castellanos has the slowest you know velocity, top you know I think top five slowest velocity. I think Eli mentioned that <laughs> one of the softest throwers in all of Major League Baseball. Yeah. But we know how Miami does with soft tossing righties or lefties, so it's not going to be easy. The third game of the series will be an afternoon game against Merrill Kelly. Sandel Contra will be on the mound finally. Ooh. Are we optimistic about Arizona this time around? Like Eli said he is. Kevin, you? Man, I don't know. It, it, it's like we, we literally got our asses handed to us in that last series. It, it wasn't even funny at that point. It was bad. It was really bad. Bender blew a save. The offense was pretty quiet at moments. I mean – Only scoring in the seventh inning. <laughs> yeah, I mean – it's been better late than never, but I don't know. I'm confident in Sandy. Is Arizona – is Chase Field a hitting part, uh, hitter friendly or pitcher friendly? For hitter who, friendly. Hitter friendly? Uh, yeah. The air is thin. It's a, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I don't know. I really don't know. I, I, I'm going to favor Miami when my season my, – when my prediction comes out, but if they could get to Humberto Castellanos here and – Miami could give enough run support to Eliezer that he could have one of his mess starts. I think they should be in good hands, at least for tonight. If they could get to Bumgarner as well, as you mentioned, Bumgarner has been probably one of the better pitchers this season with a 1.5 ERA. Yeah, 1.50 against Luzardo, who's just been one of the Marlins' best pitchers. I would say the second best pitcher in this Marlins rotation this season behind uh, Pablo Lopez. So. And then Merrill Kelly, uh, Mike mentioned him. He's actually been pretty good this season as well. So I like Miami this series a lot, especially hitter friendly. Hopefully these guys get it going. So there keeps it up from his grand slam. Hopefully gets uh, gets the ball and play a little bit more. But we'll see how it goes. Especially, yeah, just, just gotta make it. I, I think it's um, this is yeah, a must-win series at the end of the day. Must-win series. Yeah, 
I agree with you. I think I think a lot of it comes down to today tonight's game. I should say mm -hmm. um, tom tomorrow. I mean, you you have to try to get to this guy somehow. Like you said, Isaac, the Marlins, and we know this. The Marlins historically struggle against these guys that you know barely throw above ninety miles an hour. But I don't know why, but it's been like that for a long time. Um, so you have to find a way to get to this guy because tomorrow you got Bumgarner going. That guy's out for blood after what happened to him last time out. That's for sure. And I think you're going to see the reinforcements tomorrow. I think you could see Eric Gonzalez, like you said. I think you could see Brian De La Cruz as well. They got a quick start after this with the day game, back end of a very long 16 game stretch, as we all know, before the day off. So I think you're going to see the starters back in there for Sandy start. I think tomorrow we chalk it up. I chalk it up at least as an L. So tonight's game, and then the last game, I think they'll win. I think everybody will be back in there for that game, and I think they'll win. So tonight's game, I think, is your question mark. You have to get to this guy, and you have to try to really, really put it to him and make a statement for the first game of the series that we're just as pissed off as Bumgarner. We shouldn't have got swept last time out, and they're here to prove it. So they got to try to get to Castellanos. Um, that's that's for sure, and hope Eliezer can at least keep pace, like Mike said. Maybe yeah. you know, maybe maybe an inflated line, but I think the offense needs to prove that they can put up runs against uh, yeah. and I not, think, and not I think, a great yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I think the one thing everyone's going to be looking at is Eliezer. How does he do? Because I think that's the biggest storyline of at least this game itself. Yes, the Marlins need to win to at least stay in it somehow. You know, you stay two games under, one game under, that's fine. But I think if you win this, yeah, if they win the series, they'll be either at 500 or a game over it, which is perfect. If you're going to Milwaukee, you're going back home, great. But I'm more worried about Eliezer in this game in particular, besides it, instead of uh, Umberto Castellanos or even the offense getting it going, because Eliezer can't go through a lineup more than twice. It, it's not good. He can, you know, I think Tommy Hilton said it, and I think Mike said it after that. Tommy said it. You gotta hope Eliezer could get it to the through through at least the fourth inning, and if he can, perfect. Because then you could use your bullpen a little bit less. And I'll say this: I, Dylan Floro I, I, last season already. was very good against Arizona in 2021. Career-wise, he's not the greatest, but last season 2021, Dylan Floro was pretty good against Arizona. Go ahead, so, Mike. Yeah, I said I'm sorry. Cody Potts already in the bullpen. She's already ready to go. Five innings. At a relief already. Right. So the one thing I want to bring up with Ellie is or you keep hammering home, he can't get the third time through the lineup. The issue this year is that sometimes he hasn't been good the first time or the second time through a lineup. Exactly. He's just been yeah. bad. <laughs> that's that's the reason why his spot is in danger. That's the reason why the reason why he had this spot in the first place is because historically he has been like an average pitcher, if not slightly better than that, early in games, but he has not been with the exception of one start, he just has not been effective in any of his outings. You just go back to his last outing against the D-backs. He actually did pitch, I think, three scoreless innings. And then in the fourth, facing like the soft underbelly of the D-backs lineup for the second time. Not the third time, but just the second time, things blew up in his face. And then when it went around the third time, that's when they kind of KO'd him. That's the issue with Eliezer is that he his track record is – people forget this. He was – fine he's been fine when healthy the previous couple of years and this year he's pitching worse he's just not pitching as well and the changes he's tried to make to his game with his changeup, uh with his fastball commands they are not making a difference at all that's that's the concern is that you feel like he may have plateaued in his career at this point and you're not getting anything new from him anything extra he's been well scouted at this point and that's why the hope for him as a starter is dwindling pretty fast yeah, and I, I know we you know we bash him a lot, but we got to remember you know he's a, he's a human being. He listens, he reads, he knows that there's a guy breathing down his neck. How much does this affect it, affect him mentally? Because he he knows he's struggling. He knows that this is a very talented rotation, and he was in spring training. He saw how many young prolific arms that this organization has. It must not be easy, you know, to take you know, a toll like that, knowing that Max Meyer is literally right on your heels, waiting for you to struggle one more time. So you gotta, you know, think of the human element and just remember, hey, it can't be easy to just go out there and know that your job is on the line every single fifth day. So I, I give him the benefit of the doubt. Obviously, this is business, and you gotta put the best man out there, but it must, you gotta feel for the guy as well. We we talked about this, and, and I, don't just wanna, like, I don't want to beat the dead horse, but I'll just mention the usage. Um, and Eli has mentioned this about how he's become like this one pitch guy. He really has. Um, like this this year so far, he's used the fastball forty nine percent of the time, which is career low. That and of course the slider is way up there, like 38%. And then he's tried his best to mix in that changeup, and it just hasn't happened. And when he has, it's gotten hit 13%. 13%. So, yeah. Yeah, you're really, really relying on one on one single pitch, and that's his only weapon. And you can't do that. That's not a starting pitcher. I mean, you we say nowadays that 
a starting pitcher can't have two pitches. <laughs> you know, so how do you do it with one? And the answer is you don't. So this is not a starting pitcher. It's unfortunate, as as Isaac said. You know, we don't want to ever, you know, wish for a guy to fail. That's not what we do. But in terms of his ceiling as a starter, it has come and gone. I think he could do okay in the bullpen uh, as a one to two inning guy. But he's he's something's got to be done with him, especially when you have Cabrera, Meyer, uh, you know, and guys behind him. What like next year, Jake Eater is going to come back? Can you still have Eliezer Hernandez in the, in the in the rotation? Absolutely not. So you know, it's. It's 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 got to happen, and I think it needs to happen now. And, and I, I want to make two quick points before before Isaac goes. Just to expand on Eli's. In the first inning, he has a seven point two zero ERA. In the second inning, he has the same ERA, and then in the third, he's okay. He has a one point eight zero, and then in the fourth yeah. inning, he just gets destroyed. He has a twelve point six ERA, mainly getting just hit in that in those first two innings. Four earned runs in both the first and the second inning. Two homers in the first. So. Yeah, you're right, Eli. Elias is getting mashed right at the beginning. And then the final thing I want to say is look at all these guys that are coming up right now. Um, Kirby, Kirby, George. George Kirby. With the George Mariners. Kirby, there we go. I messed it up. Um, just right now, the, the Tigers have one of their top guys coming up to make a start tomorrow. You're seeing the trend that these young guys are coming up. It, it's time for Max Meyer. Uh, it just is. I don't think – it's not – it's so obvious he has to be up in the major leagues. The stats say it. You know, you compare him to Eliezer. He dominates Eliezer Hernandez. And you mentioned it, Isaac. You know, at the end of the day, this is a human being. Eliezer is one of the nicest guys on that team. I, I can assure you that from everyone who's been there. But at the end of the day, it's a business. And when you're trying to win games and trying to at least make a wild card spot, you have to put your best players out there, your best pitching and your best hitting. Eliezer is not that right now. Max Meyer is that right now. And that's what you have to do. Yeah, I think a perfect situation would be, you know, to just try to package LEAs with one of Cooper or Aguilar. Give, get Lewin Diaz up here. Get Max Meyer up here because you need some young blood here. I think that really will help rejuvenate the offense and the rotation. Imagine instead of seeing Eliezer's amazing slider and, you know, non-existent fastball, you get a Max Meyer fastball slider combination. I think that really would make this team a lot better. Moving on, I think we're getting close to predictions. Jazz Chisholm, obviously, the one last storyline is Jazz Chisholm coming back to Arizona, Chase Field. Obviously, never played there, but going back to the team that he was, he grew up with, and I guess that maybe any extra jitters. That's why he's going to be. I'm going to sort of spoil it. Am I going to be my MVP selection? I think he's going to get blood. He's not going to go for Zach Gallon. Zach Gallon is not scheduled to pitch this series, but I think we all, we all, we all are pretty optimistic about this series. So maybe we can jump straight to predictions if it's okay with you guys yeah let me just remind people uh from home you make your own predictions with fish picks every single series put together uh between five and seven props it's the same link every single time at bit.ly slash 2022 fish picks yeah right there so we have six of them for this series make your picks give away t-shirts every few weeks from breaking tea including our jazz t-shirts solar power no one's air rojas Whichever one you prefer, They're free to make the picks. The link is is right there. Just bookmark it. Try to get those in before first pitch because it picks for the entire series. But you know how we do it here on this prediction show with the ones on here. We're simply picking wins and losses for the Marlins and a series MVP. Well, Isaac, just go through your thought process as our host. Lead us by, off. by the way, there's a sorry, Eli. There's a there's a free prop to, on fish picks. You guys will you guys will see it if you go in there. The second one is a free pick. Oh boy, did I screw something up? Or did no? Did you probably made it before, Dun- before Dunan got sent down, but you put oh uh, yeah yeah ah, over under shit, one and a yeah. half hits for Dunan. Yeah, <laughs> obviously oh, that's going to be an under. So there's your freebie. <laughs> damn it, damn it, damn it, damn it. Yes, I made that this morning. I did not imagine that they would send down Dunan yet. I thought he was going to get the start against Mad Bum tomorrow. I was in there. I was good. <laughs> I was going to say this is why I always come on here because you always remind me to make my picks, but this is actually why I waited because I was waiting for Dunant to get sent down so I get the free pick. <laughs> Big blame. And one last Anyways, thing of ahead. piece of news that you know we didn't mention here, our favorite pitcher, Sixto Sanchez, is now throwing at 75 feet. So that's another little good piece of news that um, what about the that we're getting there from, from Jordan McPherson. So hopefully he gets back soon. Yeah, Sixo Sanchez still weighs away. I would chalk it up to maybe August, September for him for yeah. even a rehab assignment. Still weighs away, like I said, and he's nowhere close. But I guess we'll, that'll lead us into predictions. Marlins, Arizona, three games. Eliezer Hernandez, Jesus Luzardo, Sandy Alcantara. Two of those starters are good. Kevin, we'll start with you. 
I think we take two or three. I'll say we win tonight. Eliezer doesn't have a good start, but besides the fact. Oh, look, it's your dad, Isaac. Um, Shout out to Papa Bear out there yeah. showing support. In hey, Jack. Amazing guy, yeah. Um, Thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Mad bum, I think we lose that start. And then we'll they'll win the Sandy start. I'm serious MVP. I don't want to go Jazz. <laughs> um, I am gonna go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go Garrett Cooper. I know I, I, someone else said it, but I'll go Coop. Yeah, my bad, Mr. Eli Sussman, managing editor of Fish Stripes. Go ahead. I have the Marlins losing two out of three in the series, oh. winning just one. I don't blame the you. Uh, it's it's a vulnerable time for the team. I think we can't overstate how. Like much it hurts to not have BA and Birdie on this roster right now. And he, I mean, even Blyer, given how deep we are into this road trip, my questions about Floro have already been like put out there. Have my concerns that I don't know if he makes them better right now. So, yeah, I have them winning just one game in the series. So I will go with the D back winning series MVP. I'll go with Cattell Marte, who we've not mentioned on this entire stream, but is maybe the most talented player on either roster right now. He's awesome. Sir, Mike Anthony, your prediction of the series and MVP. I got us two out of three. I think, shockingly, I have us losing game three with Sandy. For some reason, he's not as good on West Coast games, whether it's in the West Coast or at home against West Coast teams. I don't know what it is. Last year against the Rockies, last year against the Dodgers. Something about the West Coast is just, I don't know what happens with him. So I think we lose that one. I think we win today by a big score, like big slugfest. And then I think my MVP is going to be Luzardo. He's going to have a great start. Things going to go eight. He didn't see them the last series, so I think he's going to have another good start. And I don't, I don't think they're, they're going to be able to hit him. Yeah, they're. I don't think they're ready for the Luzardo sauce. I'm, I'm with you, Mike. And that's actually a fair point about Sandy's because I'm thinking San Francisco start on opening day and San Diego start like you really said, Eli. Great stuff, but he wasn't able to get through five. And those two real clunkers last season were in California That's a great point. and in Colorado. So maybe it's a West Coast thing for him. I'm not going to look too deep into it. Mr. Alex Carver, fish on the farm expert, give us your series prediction and MVP. Yeah, um, I'm going to agree with Eli Sussman. I'm going to say that because of the situation that they're in, they're down some of their main guys, their main performers. They're down a lot of their bench. They're down a lot of their depth. They're down some of their bullpen. And now you basically got filler here. Um, you know, you got Brian Miller on the taxi squad. You know, it's 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 a rough time, and it's the end of a long stretch. Um, they just faced this team, and it didn't end up well. They faced these, these same pitchers, um, two of these same pitchers, and didn't go well. Um, they can't hit the soft tosser. Um, I think they lose tonight. I think they lose tomorrow. I think they salvage one in the Sandy start tomorrow. Like I said, is going to be the depth of your guys in there um, with the day game coming for the last game of the series for Sandy. So, yeah, I think that they lose tonight, they lose tomorrow, they salvage one uh, in the last game. And who will my MVP pick be? We talked about him. I'll go with this guy. He's up. He's the real deal. Oh, no. He's going to start every day. He's going to be their everyday center fielder. I like this guy as a prospect. Baseball loves this guy as a prospect. I'll say Alec Thomas, MVP. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Well, I, <laughs> you had no idea who I was thinking he was about to say. Who are you thinking? Don't worry about it. We're good. Have you guys um, noticed that? I don't know who else you guys were thinking about, but go ahead. No, yeah. I, don't. No worries. You know, I knew that, like the first career homers to so many people, like throughout time. Like first career wins, first career stuff is always like against the Marlins, like uh, Rodriguez earlier in the year, and all. I feel like we always go first career homers to people. Yeah. Well, hopefully that doesn't happen tonight. Oh, uh. I'm not going to be a little bit more optimistic than Mr. Suss and Mr. Carver. I think that they get out to an early lead tonight. I think that, you know, I think Jazz goes yard in the first inning. I, I see I see them scoring at least one run in the first inning of tonight's game. They win tonight. They lose tomorrow, and they win Sandy. I, I know Sandy is is crusty during, uh, during West Coast games, but he's always been good during the day, and I know that it's a West Coast game, but still I think he'll be good. So I say Miami wins two out of three. And Jazz Chisholm Jr. once again will be my MVP pick. He's the best player on this team right now, so you got to go with him. And I guess that does it for Fish Drives Live. First pitch scheduled to be in 15 minutes. Give you time to go order some food, go get a drink, go get a glass of wine because you're going to need it. 
Eliezer Hernandez and Humberto Castellanos. Not exactly a riveting pitching matchup, but nonetheless fun. Any last thoughts from either for either of you guys? I hope I'm wrong. My prediction. I hope, I hope they do win the series because it's not going to be the right vibe going back to 1997 anniversary weekends coming off an awful road trip. If they do happen, that's going to be a fun weekend. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. What I guess the positive is that entering today's game, no new players went on the COVID IL, so it seems that they are past that and they left it in San Diego. So those guys come back soon. Ba Birdie Blyer rejoined the team back in Miami. Then, then things could be all right moving forward. But this is a vulnerable. The, the time. funny thing about that is that those guys are still in San Diego. <laughs> they couldn't they go are. with the team yeah. to Arizona. So yeah. yeah, they need those guys back though, and hopefully they get well soon. But yeah, it's good. It's good that they have apparently no new problems and on that front. And I agree with you, uh, Eli. I hope we are both wrong, um, and I hope they can get two or three, at least two or three. It would be definitely yeah. be nice going into that big weekend. But enjoy the games, guys, and uh, we'll see you for the next one. Yeah, funny yeah, enough, well, Alex. Every time he predicts a negative. Um, outcome for the Marlins they somehow managed to salvage and uh and take it over so hopefully <laughs> that happens you know I was about to go on a, on an epic rant about Miguel Rojas being in today's lineup because I forgot that Brian Anderson was on the uh on the undisclosed IL so I wanted to be like I were but luckily Rie and Birdie both not there he lives another day either one of those two guys should be starting over you know the captain sometimes against righty pitching but we'll beat that around on Friday's live stream before we preview the Milwaukee Brewers. For Kevin Barral, for Eli Sussman, for Mike Anthony, for Alex Carver, for myself, Isaac, thank you so much for watching, and go fish. Why bother with empty shelves at retail stores? Waiting three days for a break to fill or driving across town to find out your hobby shop closed at four when you always have a card show in your pocket. With Loop, you can instantly you, buy cards, packs, boxes, or into auctions with the click of a button. And do it all while chatting with some of the best personalities and the best community in the hobby. Download the Loop app now on iOS or Android. Loop, a card show in your pocket.